I've watched some of the beach and um, cable, um, of the land part of the cable, connecting back to Victoria Island away. Um, so we had a series of restoration efforts stemming from that. Um, but at the time, we've been able to keep the network up and running for our customers all the time. Um, we pride ourselves on efficient service delivery. Um, if you don't have to do a last mile bill, we can get you on the network and provide the kind of connectivity you need uh, within 10 days. And, and really, we had more than adequate capacity um, to meet the broadband needs of Nigeria, West Africa. You know, people ask me, you know, why is it so slow? I can assure you it's not because we don't have the capacity on the cable, which is, you know, severely underutilized. It's because of the infrastructure challenges and the structure of the industry, which limits or inhibits our ability to drive that out. And we'll talk more about that as I go along. Uh, what our value proposition is, um, we pride ourselves on being innovative, the first private submarine cable um, to land in West Africa. We will understand that. Being reliable, I mentioned that, and that's actually guaranteed in service level agreement contracts that we sign and honor, and we're all measured on in the company uh, to achieve, uh, that we focus on achieving for our customers. And also affordable. I mean, part of what has happened since we came into the market, obviously, significant reduction in wholesale pricing for internet. That the challenge is now passing that on to the end users and having that create a ripple effect in society. But uh, I'll share some numbers as we go along. I don't know if that's the next slide and a couple of slides that really show exactly um, what the price comparisons are. Uh, what we built is a cable system that runs from Portugal to Lagos. Um, from Portugal on, we buy rather than build because there's a lot of similar infrastructure connecting most advanced parts of the world once you get into Europe. Um, that's not a significant challenge. And, and so all of our traffic, well, not all of our traffic, used to be all our traffic went to London, but we since also established uh, another hub with Taka in Portugal. So we're actually terminating some IP traffic, um, and then also IP traffic up to them in Portugal as well. But we have a full-fledged um, cable station that we operate in Lagos. We have one in Ghana, and uh, we have one in Portugal as well. And we have, uh, we've also set up a point of presence in London where we're terminating traffic uh, with several operators. Uh, the distance of the cable is 7,000 kilometers. The capacity as it's currently um, set up is 1.19 terabits per second. That's a lot, a lot, a lot of capacity. I mean, but before we came into the market, just to give it some perspective, um, SAC3, which was owned by many countries down the coast, uh, really provided 10 gigabits um, to Nigeria. Um, where using many multiples of that today, carrying traffic with many multiples of that today, and um, later on in a few months, we're getting ready for another upgrade that would actually light up more capacity out of the 1.92 between Nigeria and London. Uh, we have applied for phase two, and we continue to work on partners to do that, to extend the cable to South Africa. But obviously, those are not our home countries, and so both in terms of market dynamics, licensing, and how you get access really to distribute capacity in those markets. If, if we're challenged in Nigeria, uh, I think the challenges in some of those other geographies are, are even greater. Nonetheless, we continue to work with partners uh, because we believe it, it will give us a more resilient solution and also the ability to route traffic both directions across around the continent. Uh, when we started, the focus was on the cable and just providing capacity because there was really uh, an issue, just lack of connectivity. I mentioned that we have 10 gigabits per second. And with the challenges faced by Nitel, which, was, which is the party that owns the rights to that system in Nigeria, it was very difficult. In fact, most of our internet connectivity in Nigeria was coming through a backdoor connection into Republic of Benin um, and their own um, SAC-3 um, cable landing station. And so, you know, we came in really just fulfilling that need, capacity to the operators, so for whatever internet services they were providing, they could on-sell that into the market. 
Uh, so very focused on the physical infrastructure level. What we've done since then is grown in terms of our service portfolio, made some certain investment uh, for distribution um, at the SDH level, so we can sell units of dedicated bandwidth. Um, but again, we've also grown beyond that to deploy an IP-based network, that's internet protocol. Um, it's a backbone network that connects with other major internet uh, providers around the globe um, and essentially puts us um, at a pairing level with tier one um, providers on a global basis. So basically we're much closer to the heart of the internet um, and we can provide a variety of value added services. We're also carrying traffic for some of the global players on the internet coming into Nigeria. Some of the partners we do that with, um, Cisco, uh, they built our IP and GM network. Um, I believe the switches we have are the largest um, that Cisco has deployed um, and some of the largest deployed in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so we have a lot of room to carry all the movies, all the content you ever wanted, all that Hollywood has to export and all that Nigerians and diaspora want to bring in or all that Nigeria wants to facilitate across the region um, as we start to develop and become not just an importer of goods and services but an exporter, certainly a hub um, for business within our region, which I think is perhaps the more immediate goal that we should set for ourselves as Nigerians. Um, Global Crossing, um, that's our tier one partner to connect with them in London. We also do the same with Tata, um, who's another tier one, so these are two of the top ten internet traffic movers, so we're directly interconnected with their networks. Um, Epsilon, uh, where we get access um, to over 200 operators, um, so for some people who work with global multinational, um, they have a global virtual private network that you're trying to interconnect with, with other operators, be it on the global scene, be it AT&T, um, which is Telecom, Cable and Wireless, um, we're able to facilitate connectivity from our London hub um, to any of those global operators. Um, we have a relationship with CECOM. Um, CECOM has a similar cable system to ours on the east coast of Africa. And what we've done is we've interconnected our system in London. What that means is we are carrying traffic for one global player a um, significant amount of traffic from Nigeria to Kenya. So one of the challenges African businesses have faced is you know, to interconnect or to switch our internet traffic, right? Now basically you're taking it out to London uh, before and then you can't switch. So now it's actually even though that the cables are physically connected, we're actually just going from Nigeria to Kenya and here to Nigeria and back. And with the kind of infrastructure we have and the landings we have, we can actually start doing more of that intra-African type data exchange. So you can actually have your hub. But this company, they have their um, African uh, headquarters in Kenya. And so the Nigerian operation is directly connected through this infrastructure into that. Um, Internet exchanges, both Nigeria and Ghana have internet exchanges to which we are connected. Um, the amount of traffic switched through those exchanges are much more limited than what we're switching on our network. But we provide a platform um, for the exchange of traffic again locally. So to the extent that ISPs are bringing traffic to that platform, uh, it does not have to go to the UK or outside the country. So you can start thinking of financial information, uh, security in terms of government applications and our data. We're doing all these identity systems now. Um, I know the Americans want to help us with um, security and obviously I have a strong American relationship as well. But why should we be sending all our data, um, identity of Nigerians outside the country um, or other, other countries to manage for us? and clearly we have the capacity and the infrastructure to do that um, and to move that information from one government agency to the other uh, or to put it online for the police to access critical databases um, without having any of that information moved outside the country. 
And we're doing the same in Ghana as well. We have a local team in Ghana. Obviously, they're part of the group and they are running the, the Ghana operation with, with a lot of um, sensitivity and integration into the local ecosystem or business environment. With the connections we've established, again, that's just a pictorial view of the nodes that some of our players have across, our partners have across, across the globe. So basically, um, we can get you to these cities, and I'm sure from any of the cities, you can get to any other destination uh, that your traffic has uh, or is seeking a home in. Um, we're committed um, to quality of service. Um, first, with SLAs. Um, Providing service credits, formal testing and accepting. I see some people who are customers uh, in, the, in the room. Um, our global lock, which is run out of Lagos, um, for all our customers on a global basis, uh, manages every incident that we have uh, from our customers. It's documented. Um, a lot of uh, managers across the company uh, get this, we review it, closely um, on a monthly basis to ensure uh, that we are looking at the root causes and patterns starting to develop and being proactive about managing uh, problems arising uh, in our network. So not that we don't have challenges or problems or performance issues as I mentioned, but the challenge is having enough diversity that you can walk around it or try to create solutions to your problems. Uh, solutions to those problems before they start having too many adverse impacts on your customers. What we find is, you know, 99% of the problems occur in the last mile of our network. Um, a lot of our customers lose power, um, and so their devices come down, or their network comes up down, and we're calling them, and they're trying to bring it back up there. A lot of people also. Um, tend to recycle their devices, I don't know why, but uh, you know, they were testing the network, so they were testing the <laughs> network. Uh, World class, uh, 24 by 7. Um, their engineers there, we continue to increase um, both the number, the training and skill set that those engineers have so that they can respond as we roll out new services. Um, ongoing monitoring, uh, we have tools that are monitoring the network, monitoring the data uh, that each customer is carrying uh, on their service, so if we see that uh, suddenly a customer that was passing traffic goes off the air and that's a trigger, even if the network is not down, to initiate a call um, or an inquiry as to why they're not no longer passing traffic. So it's a proactive monitoring of what's going on in that network. It's also backed up with support, not just of our engineers, but we do keep uh, maintenance agreements and service contracts for all the technology that we've deployed, including the submarine cable system. Um, so should we have, uh, and we hope we haven't had any such incidents, but should we have an incident of aggression or damage in the sea, we've engineered the system uh, with a high degree of reliability and obviously that's paying off in terms of what we're saying, we haven't had any damage in the sea, but should we have that, uh, we have a cable on standby, uh, along with other cable operators, that is in Cape Verde, uh, that can be quickly dispatched. It has our spares on the cable already, um, and it can be quickly dispatched to do a subsea repair on our behalf. Um, Standard operating procedures, we document, document, document. I know digital jewels has done a lot of work in the areas of ISO and standardization, and that's something that we're starting to aspire to with the operational base and history we have uh, to now get some of those certifications to back up the process orientation that the company has adopted. Um, now, is there anyone in this room? on this slide, um, I don't think so. Maybe I chose not to embarrass anybody, but <laughs> this is a sampling of uh, who our customers are. Um, I think we know a lot more today, but this also reflects the mix um, of people that we are doing business with. A lot of operators, uh, internet service providers, but we also see uh, banks, um, hotels, um, and other um, corporate institutions uh, that we're doing business with it. We're also starting to connect a few uh, government institutions. I have a question. So really, that, that's who we are, and, and that's what we've done. And obviously, when we look at who 
we've reached and with all this, all this big 2 terabit, 1.92, that's a little bit of the 2 terabit cable. Uh, what, what is the impact? I, I think the, the first impact we have is on what we call wholesale or pricing at the business to business level. Um, prior to 2010, uh, bandwidth was easily $1,000. Uh, dollars per meg, and what we've seen is a significant reduction in prices to about 300. In some instances, uh, exactly 2,500 per meg is you were buying, and so there's been a significant reduction in pricing at that level. Um, what we haven't seen is now the terrestrial bandwidth pricing starting to change. Obviously, that's not an area we've deployed infrastructure. So it shows the power of actually doing the bills on being able to change the pricing and, and of course with the bill we have with a lot of capacity, uh, the laws of you know, pricing elasticity, the more we move, you know, if we're selling it at a lower price, we can still recover the value of the investments that we've made. On the terrestrial side, uh, pricing is just as expensive as, as where we are now on the international side, which is a real deterrent because I think we were at a meeting in uh, and then someone said, oh, the cost of Lagos building from Lagos to Abuja, and I said the cost of building from Lagos to Abuja can never approach the cost of building from Lagos to London. But the challenges you face, the self-imposed challenges, I'm not so slightly, uh, between our governments, which represents us, and uh, are you used to maybe unemployed and area boys and uh, local governments who also may want to uh, make some revenue for it, make it so difficult and challenging. And so the people who are able to accomplish it essentially price it out of the market. We also do not have uh, an incumbent phone company that has arrived in this country. In Ghana, I mean, we're starting to do some builds now into neighboring countries, but all of our services are delivered by uh, the National Communications Backbone Company, which is a subsidiary uh, within Vodafone Ghana, which privatized uh, Ghana Telecom. So, you know, our inability uh, to privatize Nitel or have that common backbone infrastructure to carry the traffic um, around the country has made it very difficult and expensive for us to, to drive bandwidth around the country. Well, there's something called phase three. Yes. Uh, they that are using the uh, power lines. Power lines. Yes. Are they not viable? Uh, they're viable, but I'm not sure how much capacity they have. Uh, so obviously, they have not been able to move as much traffic as uh, there is requirement, and also what the cost profile is. But I am telling you, I know this is quite well. Yeah. So that they are. I mean, the, the, the interesting thing about Nigeria is that it, when you look at it, it's not that we don't have infrastructure around the country. It's the access. It's the price of the, the infrastructure. It's the um, so the ability of businesses to afford the international plus the domestic plus the um, equipment plus the power um, plus the skills. Um, deploy it and, and then leverage it effectively. But yes, there are there are solutions. Um, you know, uh, the national backbone that exists, but they are all proprietary and um, you know, the, the capacity and terms on which third parties can utilize that to deliver um, to businesses, mass market, uh, or are, are somewhat of a deterrent at this point. Yes. Uh, what do we consider the options of working with? Okay, my name is Lentino okay. Valentero from Sri Lanka Management Limited. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to look at the possibility of you working with state government because many of the issues you have highlighted is that of media voice and local government permit, which is easy at different states that they can be handled. So if you form an alliance with the state government, then it's easier for um, Nehwon Kehu to now um, penetrate those states and they actually be able to part from it. The government of the issue we're having now is the area of life man. Yes. And you know, the, the, we know that the life man um, link is there. Yes. You know, already, but at state level, if you look at the population of Nigeria, we actually need this 
backbone down to the interior. And unless we bring it to the state level, where some other SMEs can now try to now be bringing to their villages, to the local government, and all those things, we will not be able to enjoy the infrastructure as it is now. So, working with the state government is very, very can, can pick one of the state government and experiment it. So, if that is done, then we will be able to make you know, a lot of energy. No, you're right. Um, I, mean, I think you mentioned a couple of things. Um, state government. Um, also SMEs, I mean, we have started working uh, with Lagos State, for example, and deploying our own infrastructure here in Lagos last year um, to get to certain customers. Uh, I believe I'll pick on SkyBank. Um, we have deployed fiber, and then the microwave backup to get to their locations to provide them with service. I think the same with uh, EAT. I don't know if we're delivering on microwave or uh, fiber. Fiber. So we're delivering on fiber to PAT. So we are starting to build infrastructure. Uh, it's a slow and cumbersome process. We work with small, uh, smaller providers. So also kind of feeding the ecosystem in terms of contractors who are doing the build for us. But really, I mean, what I advocate in that respect is we can, you know, we'll, we'll drive it to every state, but we know what we do well and it's a high touch critical mass, large volumes, um, and then the depth of skill and expertise required to do that. What I'd like to see is an ecosystem of ISPs that the states are enabling, that we're working with, that are actually in those communities, connecting up their schools, so we don't have to worry from here about connecting all the schools on a nationwide basis. And we're a country in a hurry. We really should be doing it at those levels, where the SMEs are working, the local ISPs are working with the state, we're bringing it to them, and they're connecting, they're developing applications, they're creating jobs for some of those students as they graduate, and so we're building uh, a more sustainable ICT infrastructure. It's just not driven by a few large companies at the center which is a lot of what I'll be talking about as I, as I go on this presentation. So really, um, retail bandwidth pricing um, has really not moved much. Uh, the entry price, I think, is lower. So for about $10 a month, you can at least get access on your device for some limited bandwidth. Uh, but if you want 24 by 7 dependable service, um, you know, from a Swift or um, an IPNX or Stockholms or providers who uh, focus on that higher segment of the market, then, or even the DSM providers uh, with their 24 by 7 services, you'll be paying close to 10,000 Naira a month. Uh, what we see are more service providers, obviously, more widespread deployment and focus on, on data services. Um, internet usage, so the number of internet users. Um, in Nigeria has taken a significant increase, but in terms of access speeds and having that always on um, availability, you know, we're still really not there. So what is that? Which kind of leads to the interesting topic of this discussion: internet ubiquity. Um, you know, what what is ubiquity, and, and why is internet ubiquity? Well, you can really say it's apparent, it's everywhere you go, always on, you know. When you, when you go to some places in, in Europe or, um, you know, Singapore, I was through a few years ago, at the airport, the terminals, you just go up, you don't have to pay, you can get access to the internet, it's, it's not that difficult. Um, it's expected that you will have access to the internet. Some services are designed purely to be accessed by the internet. You can't get access to the internet, you're in trouble. It used to be, even if you travel now, you go to a hotel, there's a uh, station in the lobby because it's just like you check in online and you print your boarding pass before you show up at the airport. So, you know, that's ubiquitous. It's expected that everyone can get access to it at any time, um, anywhere, and, and it's such a part of the fabric of, of daily existence. Of course, to be ubiquitous, it needs to be affordable. Um, it needs to be accessible. It needs to be reliable. Just think of those airlines. If you need to do online checking and it's not reliable, how are you going to, you know, they're, they're, they're going to be out of business. So it needs to be reliable. It needs to be sustainable. Because you can't just do it for six months or you can't just do it and have it go away. And it, it's something obviously that they need to continue to develop because it becomes a part of the way they live and how they exist in those societies where the internet is available. And you see the manifestations in, in the, the every facet of life, 
in, in advanced economies and where the internet penetration is much greater, education. You know, right from elementary school, um, who are, your parents are interacting with the teachers, they're getting grades for their students online, the students are getting assignments online, they're doing projects and submitting it, they're doing research projects because they have access to libraries uh, or they have devices in their own homes that have the internet, they're applying to colleges online, uh, they're taking tests and, and um, exchanging information online. So it, it's you know learning. You have a lot of universities that have their content uh, live on the internet. Um, you don't have to show up in class because um, you can just be um, on the net and you know be plugged into the virtual classroom and, and get uh, the live feed of, of the lectures. Indeed, I, I can't imagine. You know, we keep looking at all these top rankings of universities and say Nigerian universities are not on there. Um, I can't imagine that any of those universities, universities that make the top 100 or top 500 rankings are not such that as soon as you step on campus as a student, you have access to an unlimited Wi-Fi network just as part of your tuition to get into the university. And to think of how much that enables the student. Your teacher says something, professor says something that you don't understand. Boom, you're on Wikipedia, one other source, trying to drop information. Um, looking at research papers, um, it used to be the, the old world journals were published. Nobody publishes paper journals again. You know, you go online to get your journal and, and really that that be um, of information um, and exchange that you need for learning um, is it, something we're yet to see here. Um, one other area, uh, you know, it was in Ghana last week, we were talking about uh, national research and education networks. You know, the need to create that, to create that here, to create that across Africa, so our universities are collaborating and if they have research projects they're doing, they're sharing information so they can come up with greater. Uh, development and investment is, is clearly one area where when you have the internet present everywhere, you can start to see an impact. Government, government services, um, commerce, we're talking about cashless legals now, and that is the first step um, to doing commerce in a lot of the world. A lot of buying and selling is, you know, for everything from hard goods to soft goods is being done um, over the internet. Um, you know, can be delivered online, it will be, you'll get your Netflix, your um, Kindle, which will deliver your books to you, um, iTunes will deliver your music to you, and oh by the way, if you want to buy clothing or whatever, you can also go to Amazon or any of these sites and order what you like, um, you can even give them your measurements, they'll custom make things and send it to you. Um, media, uh, clearly media and entertainment is big, we have um, you know, really strong content in terms of media uh, in this country. Um, and, and it is trickling onto the global stage, but clearly, um, given the interest around the continent, even with the platforms like DSTV, and we travel across most parts of Africa, and they're showing Nigerian movies, um, see what we could be doing if we're able to leverage this more on the, on the internet. And um, healthcare. Um, other services, banking services, travel services, um, you name it, even um, production of agricultural goods and movement into commodity markets. So clearly, um, we need internet ubiquity. I think we all agree, I hope we would all agree, that it would make our lives easier. In terms of creating a modern society, you know, we'll talk about Vision 2020, 2020. Um, these are some of the essential goals of the law. I don't know as a nation how we can compete if we do not have um, more of these kinds of resources to facilitate our participation um, in the global space as a modern economy. What are the inhibitors? Um, affordability, uh, high cost of goods and production here. So you have to do your own power, we talk about it, getting into the ports, you know, and for duty, taxes, fees, licenses, it's the reasons why a lot of things, have, and we look at it, we, we take it for granted, but the cost of producing goods and services is really high here in Nigeria. So when you add up all the overhead that you have to incur, um, and, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, because even things you can do online, um, you have to send someone, um, cost of work, well, just went up, you know, so when you, the cost of the depreciation of the automobile, when you add all these 
together even for communication services, the cost of production becomes higher. And then when you look at the capacity of the market supply, which is also limited, you're spreading that cost over a very small base of consumers. How big are the the great place to work? Excuse me? Big all the data from the great place to work. I was a few years ago at the Money One Table Conference. Okay. Uh, the uh, representative of the Honorable Minister of Communication was there. And uh, he expressed a major concern. Uh, the concern is simply this. Number one, uh, we have the lowest, about the lowest bandwidth in Africa. Sure. And reason being this, um, in most countries, like I know in UK, I was there, and uh, you have the major infrastructure provided by BT. Others just plug into it, and uh, because of BT is government, they have the financial way without provide that framework. Um, but here, he said, what the issue is, you have main one, you have blue one, and I think one or two others trying to create this channel, and it's not big enough. The financial implication is very very huge. Um, that if it were possible for all of them to combine and just create a super highway. Uh, perhaps we can get that bandwidth where other kind of businesses can spring that from. And then when he said that, this is my concern. It that means if no one wants to achieve this vision, you have to go somewhere and get money, it's an investment. And if you don't get this money, there has to be a break even period, there's a payback period. Then when do we arrive at this thing being one affordable? That's the first question. Number two is you find so many um, uh, what do you call it um, 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 wireless um, providers around, and it's almost like a, a mirage. You know, you buy them, you use them for one day, and after three months, they're not delivering. That's that's that we have, that's what we have here. And then you, my question then is this. Affordability, this people have to go and get money from wherever. And you know, parallel in our society, the financial system is not fast enough to get money from a fixed income instrument. You have to go to banks, it's costly. When are we going to get to this affordability? When are we going to have real, you know, the strategy is everywhere, it's really everywhere and not a mirage. Okay. Um, Great question. You hit on some good points. I'll address the VT part of it, and then a lot of the other items I also talk about in my presentation. So uh, actually, VT has been privatized. VT okay. was privatized in the 1980s. Um, it used to be owned by the government, just like on Mitel. Um, they sold shares in multiple phases until it was fully sold to the public. And now BT is a publicly listed company. That, but but you're right. In in almost every country, BT in France is France Telecom. In uh, Germany, it's a Deutsche um, Deutsche Telecom. In in the U.S., it's companies that came out of the old AT&T system, um, there's AT&T and SBC today, and there's Verizon that I work for, um, essentially covering the US. What you had was the original incumbent telecommunications companies that were government owned were divested. Now, if you, it's just like, you know, even think of road networks, you know, there were pathways created, so there were routes that they created, um, cables that they laid, um, and Nigeria also had that kind of infrastructure, because we had telegraph infrastructure, and um, we were participating in satellite projects like right here uh, in the 70s. So there was a lot of this infrastructure um, that those countries continued to build on. Uh, you have right away a uh, coaxial cable. Obviously, when fiber came along, you went ahead and you upgraded it. And what those countries have successfully done is by preserving and continuing to evolve that BT structure, it becomes the common backbone. Yeah. They've also put in place regulation um, to ensure that you have, they, they serve as a common carrier so that every operator can be does not have to deploy their infrastructure. In fact, it's a dissentive from them to deploy proprietary infrastructure because the cost of that infrastructure is lower. In the UK, within the past two years, especially as they've gone through a difficult economic period, 
They've actually funded, the government has funded BT, considerable sums of money to upgrade the backbone network and make that fiber available to um, other providers. So if, you're, if you spend time in the UK, there's Virgin Mobile, there's all kinds of um, broadband services. I mean, there are at least four or five brands that are packaged differently that you can buy, but all these companies don't run a national backbone. They're able to buy from BT and really focus on different areas and really drive this thing deep into the economy. So, you know, as a vision, that, that's the kind of, I mean, not necessarily the, the whole UK thing, but you can see how, you know, we can possibly start achieving this kind of ubiquity. But you're right, doing it the way we're doing it, it's slow, it's expensive, it's absolutely not friendly to the consumer, because if everybody builds their own expensive cost of capital, capital is more expensive here, our consumers, who have um, a lower um, GDP per capita are paying a lot more um, for services that we really need to develop. I mean, so it's kind of counterintuitive. Uh, accessible, again, same issues, lack of widespread data delivery networks. You know, we, we, we left Nitel, we went and built all this DSM focused on voice. Really great, um, but I, I, I don't see any advanced economy that runs its business on a GSM backward network. And something I say all the time, I say to my friends in the GSM world as well, let's stop equating communications infrastructure to GSM. You know, there are some things it can do, there are some things it cannot do. But when we start talking about GSM and uh, schools, I said, uh, is, are, are children going to do spreadsheets on a phone? No, they have access to the internet, they have a mobile phone, they can get, um, you know, some Facebook or something or Twitter. <laughs> like, okay, you know, I don't know whether they do PowerPoint or complex analysis on that mobile phone. So let's not just um, limit ourselves in terms of what we can do, or the potential, or the need to participate effectively in a global economy. But really, the infrastructure um, to meet the major population centers, as you said, to do that uh, is a constraint. Reliable, uh, it's not dependable enough to rely on for critical services. It's easier to make it dependable if it's shared. Because right now you have every company running around, building its own cables, having to put resources in the field to fix those cables. If we had one big cable, actually any of these cables have the inherent capacity, because fiber and the electronics can carry so much bandwidth, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's not even an issue. It's really a question of how you use it, how you give people access to it, how you manage it. Uh, but so if we all put our resources together and, and we had a framework, a regulatory framework that enabled, truly enabled and compelled um, shared infrastructure, then we could all benefit and we put a little more resource onto it and what each person would pay, each service provider would pay to get their fair share of that backbone would be a lot less than they're having to pay now doing it themselves. Uh, sustainable. Uh, again, right there, not easy and affordable to maintain. Ability to capture the full value of that investment. Um, it's also a constraint to see, if, as someone said, think 1996 and think today, how many of the telephone, telecom operators in Nigeria that you had at that time do you have in business now? Um, you know, so how much value has been lost? Um, you know, we're doing things in a way that's not necessarily creating the most additionality to the ecosystem. So we're not building on, you know, we're not like VT, you know, they continue to build. Um, I'm sure they were the days of Telegraph, who knew what fiber was, you know? And, you know, I won't overrise it. You know, you think these are companies that have been doing things for more than 100 years, you know? And, and, and of course, it's, you know, the technology changed, the people changed. Uh, the skill sets requires change, the modes of doing business change, but they continue to involve those institutions to meet the needs of their people. And, and so I think that there, there are structural limitations that we have um, in terms of the robustness of the sector um, and uh, the institutions that we've created for providing services to us today in terms of really continuing to nurture that kind of long-term viability. Um, you know, going further to the Nigerian context, this is what you said. Uh, we don't have a communications backbone or shared infrastructure. Um, the requirement for every service provider to build their own. And you know, we, some of these operators who have the proprietary, because NITEL did not work, everybody came in and had to start building their own. Uh, yeah, some of them will sell some of it to you, but at a very costly price. 
which is why if you come in as an ISP and admire what some of the ISPs are trying to do, you know, mostly homegrown businesses, uh, people who have a passion for this work really and uh, want to provide services in Lagos, you have to deploy first how you get to the customer, which may be a YMAX network or some kind of uh, least based distribution because we don't have wide infrastructure. Then if you're going to connect more than one neighborhood in Lagos, you have to buy very expensive infrastructure um, to get from your base station in Lekki to your switch in BI um, to connect Lagos Island and then to connect the Kedja. Wow! That's already significant uh, expense and infrastructure. That someone doing it in another market will probably not have spent half or a third of that to deploy equivalent services. In addition, such networks are not really built or optimized for data. So the amount of usage that they have, they have to recover the full cost and more profit um, from that network. So what they're charging you is so high, um, just to get a little bit, because really the way they accept it is to carry the voice on their GSM. So they can give you a small channel, which if you're trying to download a movie or whatever, and that's what you find with these wireless providers, as you mentioned it. I, I think very good intention. The technology, a lot of the new ones, I would say next generation, there's just kind of a new generation of those providers who have come up, at least in, in recent years. The technology they're deploying is quite capable of delivering the service, uh, but their ability, I mean, I, I think one just, access to capital is a real issue for most businesses doing that in the country. Second is um, the ability to get enough bandwidth to distribute that um, to all those places. So that's why when you buy that service, maybe the first month, when you're the only one on the network, or just you and two of your friends, um, the service is really great. Um, and then two months later, uh, when you've told all your friends how great it is, and they've also bought it, and come on the network, <laughs> then the service starts degrading. So, so that, is, that is the challenge, and you know, the refresh um, of this technology is not really there. I've almost used all my time. Um, so limited and costly distribution. You know, costs within the country are more expensive than international connectivity. And you know, scale and capital to, to, to deploy their own networks. Um, inhibitors, um, the industry is developing in a very uh, closed manner, which is big players, you can build your own infrastructure. Otherwise, you're at the mercy of everyone else, which I think is, is a very challenging issue. What we're finding is, um, you know, of course, the large players wield so much power and influence that it seems there's a question about how much we can really regulate them um, to comply or to share infrastructure so as not to deter direct foreign investment. Um, I, I think some of that is actually overdone because obviously other countries have um, done this before. Um, and then, you know, sustainability. You know, the enabling environment to actually help this access to capital, access to skills that the universities don't have access to somebody graduates computer science and has not had 24 by 7 access to computing for, uh, I would say, probably eight years, because I would say the average computer science graduate in the United States probably had four or five years of high school, or Korea, or China, or India, where they were already on the computer almost all the time, and then, you know, when they're in the university, it's like unlimited, you know, more than coming out of their ears, right? And so, how, how is that per se going to create the next Google, or the next Yahoo, you know? That, those are some of the, the challenges, which also then limit the ability to continue to drive the system. Yes? Other challenges, so we become very consumption oriented, which is something we need to worry about as a society, because ICT is all about consuming, and you know, I, I see the number is it's 1% of GDP by spending on communication, how much of that are we really retaining in the economy um, other than exporting and creating value um, in our economy. Uh, limited local content, you know, we have very strong um, cultural and traditional values, um, but really you don't see that, very strong socialization. I mean, 
you know, you can see, you know, Nigeria, Facebook, Nigeria, and Twitter, because we're very, we have very powerful social networks, but we're not really bringing those into the information age. Uh, we continue to lag on major economic indicators, and in most parts of the world, ICT is actually what's helping to drive a lot of those indicators, um, and obviously, um, we see the impact on education and job creation. Uh, what have other countries done? Uh, and I just want to talk about some of those we talked about in the UK, is actually you force the implementation of shared infrastructure. These are regulatory services, people build the services by getting concessions from government, they are limited resources, and so there's an obligation to share. Um, at commercial rates, but reasonable commercial rates. Um, and if that's not done, then the regulator comes in and they make adjustments to that. So in the US and the UK, they have a funding. You can buy a line in someone's home and deliver your services over it. You can buy a line from BT, you can buy a line from Verizon and deliver services over it. Um, also separate wholesale and retail entities. So BT also sells retail, but the wholesale division is different and the books can be audited um, and is reviewed by the regulators. And also the quality of service they provide to the service providers are regulated. And I know at Verizon we used to pay fines. You know, if you don't provide the service to them within seven days, if after you provide it within first 30 days, you have too many of those circuits that have a problem, then you pay fine to the FCC. So, so they put the checks and balances in to ensure these systems actually work. Um, in Kenya, you know, nothing existed. They said, let's build. So the government builds all the operators you come and you're going to share. They don't manage it, they turn it over to Kenya Telecom. South Africa controls liberalization. They we're going to give you people. Um, the rights to build, as they build, all of you will come and share it. So there are different models in different parts of the world. In Nigeria, there's actually um, at least three or four, um, I would say, good um, networks that get to at least two-thirds of the major cities in the countries today. It's just really access and how those networks are managed and evolved um, on a proprietary basis versus a public basis. I really don't think we have the need to build new infrastructure because we're only just going to add on more costs that we're passing to the customer.